Hello, everyone, and welcome at today's webinar. Um, the webinar of today is looking into the Desert to Power program uh, of the African Development Bank. So the coming hour, we uh, will get a presentation from Usenu Nakolima, Director for Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency at the African Development Bank. Um, and uh, to look a little bit further in this program that uh, the African Development Bank is launching, um, so this is the agenda for today. I am Lydia van Os, uh, Project Manager Africa uh, at Solar Plaza. Um, when we speak about the Desert to Power program, we will look into the scope, background and efficient impact of the initiatives. And also we will learn more about the partnerships that drive the program and opportunities for the private sector in both the on-grid and the off-grid segments. Um, after the presentation of uh, Mr. Nakulima, we will have an extensive Q&A. Um, we hold, host this webinar in uh, anticipation of our conference in Nigeria, the Solar Future in Nigeria, uh, that will take place on the 15th and 16th of May in Abuja. Uh, it is the second edition um, covering the full solar PV electrification spectrum. Um, from utility scale to solar pico solar and everything in between. Um, like last year, we will have a tailored B2B matchmaking uh, between business and finance uh, parties. Um, and we will focus purely on the Nigerian market so that we can truly go in depth. A little bit more about Solar Plaza for those who don't know as yet. Um, the mission of Solar Plaza is to positively impact the world by accelerating the sustainable energy transition. Uh, we are established in 2004 and we organized over 100 events. We are a knowledge platform and uh, we create uh, webinars, articles. Of course, we do conferences that a lot of people know us from and um, we also host missions. Um, we are active in over 30 countries worldwide and uh, we have a global PV professional network of more, more than 60,000 people. So in today's webinar, we have a lot of time for questions. Um, this will be a very interactive um, webinar. Um, so the Q&A session with the audience will be quite long. Um, so please make use of the question box on the right side of your screen uh, to drop all the questions that you have. You might already have questions prepared before the webinar. Um, so in that case, um, you can already drop them and uh, maybe throughout the presentation of Mr. Nakulima, you will think of more questions. Uh, do not hesitate to ask them throughout the webinar. At the end, uh, we will have time to uh, bring all the questions up and to discuss them further. Some practical notes, um, if you experience any technical issues, uh, use the chat box on the right side. So just to be clear, if you have questions, uh, drop them in the question box. And if there are technical issues, use the chat box for uh, assistance. And uh, the presentation slides will be made available after this webinar. So now I will introduce Mr. Usenu Nakulima. As said, Director for Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency, he heads the Desert to Power program um, from the AFTBC side. Uh, we will now go to his presentation. So, Mr. Nakulima, please, please take the stage. Thank you very much, uh, Lydia. Good afternoon, colleagues. Um, it's a privilege to be here and to have this opportunity to share with you what we have been working on for the past year and uh, to get both uh, questions, but also more importantly, feedback and inputs uh, that can help uh, structure it in a better way and address uh, as uh, much as possible the expectation and the needs of our various constituencies. So the Desert to Power program is, as, to, as, as the name indicates it, is a program. It's not another initiative, it's a program. And I would even say an investment program. The reason being that we 
think at the African Development Bank that tremendous work has been going on and is being done uh, presently to mobilize policymakers and institutions around the world, but more particularly around the Africa region, uh, also around the solar industry. Uh, and this uh, mobilization, these initiatives uh, are now in need and are expecting uh, the financial institutions like us to transform the willingness, uh, the drive that they have been uh, promoting into actual investment and actual program on the ground. Just to give you two examples, talking about this region, in particular the Sahel region, some of you may have heard about what we call in French Alliance pour le Sahel, which is the Sahel Alliance, uh, which is an alliance of different countries, different institutions to support the, the countries of the Sahel region, five of them uh, at, 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 at the first stage, uh, tackle issues like climate change, droughts, insecurity. So this is a kind of political uh, mobilization around the region. On the other hand, you have at the international level uh, interesting initiatives trying to um, harness the solar power for development. One example is the International Solar Alliance and the African Development Bank just signed about two weeks ago uh, an agreement with this International Solar Alliance and the objective is to unlock the solar industry and make it benefit countries, uh, African countries and more generally developing countries. But linked to the International Solar Alliance, I mentioned the Terawatt initiative, uh, which has the aim of really inducing a paradigm shift in how solar uh, projects are deployed around the world, and in particular in, in Africa. You know, project finance has been the driving process for infrastructure, and in particular energy. But uh, as some of you, especially project developers, have experienced, Project finance is a very heavy process for uh, solar uh, projects. And, and we need to think about a uh, leaner and swifter and more efficient process to channel funding to this. And that's the aim of Terrawatt. And last but not least, uh, one program that of our partners, uh, the International Renewable Energy Agency is driving, is the West Africa Clean Corridor. So all these are political and institutional initiatives that uh, wholly will mobilize resources and energy around this region and around this uh, industry. So our objective with the Desert to Power program is to have these two goals, the region and the industry need. And as a financial institution, what we want to do is to design investment programs. This is the first one and mobilize financing to turn this willingness into action on the ground. Now, let me say a little bit more specifically what we want to do. Um, you have to look at this program in the context of climate change. Africa, and in particular the Sahel region, which is the 11 countries going from the Atlantic coast to all the way to Djibouti and Eritrea, these 11 countries. So this region is the one, suffering, one of the regions that is suffering the most uh, from climate change. Uh, and at the same time, uh, it is the one attracting the least climate finance. Uh, you know that since uh, the Paris Agreement was signed, there has been a lot of political momentum uh, around climate finance for both mitigation and adaptation to climate change. But when you look at the distribution of climate finance in the regions, Africa has been attracting, if I take the figures for 2016, only 3% of all climate finance flows around the world. So this is the context in which we are working on. And in the region, uh, the climate change threats are translating into uh, changing uh, patterns of rainfall, uh, droughts, migration, and unfortunately also terrorism. So we think that we, by harnessing the sun, 
uh, with increased and cheaper solar power, we can not only make sure that future investments in this region in energy will be clean and contributing to reducing global emissions, but also we think that by increasing drastically and quickly investment in energy in this region, we can build resilience, resilience against drought and over climate induced threats. So we kill two birds with one stone, we reduce emissions, but we also help these countries develop. So the vision is for us in a very concrete terms to contribute significantly by mobilizing our own resources, our own expertise, but also expertise and resources from our partners, from private sector, from to contribute to deploying 10 gigawatt of solar PV uh, by 2025 for the 250 million people living in part of Africa. The expected outcomes are clear. We hope by this effort to provide electricity, not only for lighting, but also for productive use to 250 million people in these 11 countries. This includes on-grid solutions for 160 million people, but also increasingly off-grid solutions for 90 people, including clean cooking solutions. If you look at the last report from the International Energy Agency, um, it is um, anticipated that half of the future access to energy will be done through off-grid. So that's why in this presentation, I will try to show how we, the bank, wants to promote and how we are already trying to promote innovative business models for decentralized electricity generation, but also how we think about the mobilizing competitive financing of this. So these are the two key themes I will uh, delve into in the rest of this presentation. Another important outcome that we are trying to uh, reach through these initiatives and this investment is to increase local content and to facilitate the emergence of a local industry. The one of the beauty of solar is that it's a simple technology which can be accessible very quickly and very soon to local entrepreneurs and to local industry. So this will be one important goal for us. Now, I talked about two twin uh, concrete outcomes. The one is for concrete uh, ways to, to, to achieve these outcomes. One is to uh, foster innovative business models. And the other one is to facilitate uh, and uh, mobilize uh, financing at scale. So let me come back to this slide. Now, how can we support the agents of innovative business models? So that's one key objective that we have. Uh, if you look at this slide, we talk about two sets of um, type of investment. One is on grid, and the other one is off grid and green mini grids. So on the on-grid part, on the left side, the left hand side of this slide, uh, we have noted, you know, the bank has been working on this sector for many, many years. And uh, just for your information, last year in 2017, the bank has financed uh, for worth about 1,400 megawatts of renewable energy. So 100% of our investment last year in energy was renewable energy. And uh, uh, I would say about 30% uh, of it was uh, for private sector. So we have a certain experience of uh, the, this type of investment. And what we learned from our experience is that, well, things are not working as well as they should. Um, on the on-grid part, what we think is really needed today is to bring more efficiency in the implementation of solar projects and uh, lower the cost of uh, both the transaction cost and the financing cost. So if I look at the on grid part, the, we want to unlock the IPP development process and how we would do it. Uh, some of the work that has already started 
uh, is something that we will keep supporting. For instance, the standardization of documents. Uh, each transaction today is negotiating its own purchase agreement, its own implementation uh, agreement, and just doing it for each project is not an efficient process. So some institutions have started a standardization process, one of them being the IRENA and uh, in partnership with Terraware. So these are the kind of initiatives we will be uh, supporting. How? By helping countries uh, take full ownership of the process and making sure that these standard documents are fit for the purpose. What we don't want is these standard documents to be just uh, imposed on them. And we believe that country ownership is key and that countries be part of the elaboration of these standard documents. Another way for us to unlock the IPP development process would be to provide advisory to governments. We have already, the bank has been the main sponsor of the creation of what we call the Africa Legal Support Facility, which is a technical assistance program providing uh, financial and legal advisory to, to countries. So uh, the ALSF, the African Legal Support Facility, has already done a lot of work and we will reinforce it and provide uh, this type of transaction support to governments, thereby accelerating the negotiation process. Last but not least, importantly, to unlock the IPP development process, we have to make sure that the infrastructure around the IPPs are uh, ready to receive uh, more renewable energy generation. So the way we are doing it is by increasing the public investment in the grid, and in particular by exploring how we can make storage cheaper and more adapted to, to the needs. Another important uh, uh, thing that we want to do on the on grid part is to align public and private sector interests. Uh, for those who have some experience also in uh, the uh, uh, project finance, in particular the independent power produce, producing uh, production, uh, one, uh, one, one, one uh, issue is the um, agreement between the private sector and the public party. Often you will see that uh, IPPs, once they have reached financial flows, and even once uh, after a while after, after starting producing power. There, there are many instances where there will be conflicts between the public and the private party, and this is also not efficient for both. So what we want to do is to foster innovative models where public, the public sector, especially the power utility, and the private sector that has been called to develop IPs have their interests aligned. And we have already done something like that. Uh, if you go to Morocco, uh, the uh, Moroccan Agency for Sustainable Energy, MAZEN, is an agency that has developed hundreds of megawatts uh, for the past uh, six, uh, six years uh, with the support of the African Development Bank and other agencies like Agence Française de Développement or the European Investment Bank. And the model of MAZEN is such that MAZEN, which is a public utility, is the co-financer of the uh, independent power uh, production units of these special purpose vehicles. They procure, they select competitively private uh, sector operators, but they jointly invest in these SPVs. So this is something we will also try to uh, adapt to the needs of various countries in the Sahel region. If you look at the other side of uh, this uh, slide, the orchid and green mini grids, this is area also where there is a lot of innovation to uh, either support or promote. On the off-grid part, we are already engaged with many companies uh, on their pay-as-you-go uh, models, and this is a way for us to make uh, commercially viable the, uh, the projects that uh, aim at providing uh, solar kits to rural population. Uh, and the other part of it, which is, in my opinion, the most difficult one, but the most promising, is a green mini-grid part. 
So we are already in contact with some of the countries of the region to see how we can support the hyb hybridization of uh, mini grids that are today powered by diesel, but that could be more viable, more sustainable if we put some uh, solar panels to uh, hybridize the generation type. But uh, this cannot be sustainable if you don't have a good revenue model. And one way for us to address the revenue side of this project is to see how we can combine um, the power generation uh, with the agriculture investment, especially the agriculture value chain, uh, to make sure that this power is um, produced for productive use, thereby inducing um, a virtual cycle. Now, this was about the business models. Let's talk about uh, the how to mobilize financing to support these business models. Um, basically, if you look at the on-grid part, uh, one thing we want to do, as I said, we want to mobilize our own financing, uh, but I've tried here to explain uh, clearly and simply the type of financing that we're talking about. On the on-grid part, we feel that project development is still something that is crucial in order to um, accelerate the, the process of deploying uh, generation capacity. So we want to mobilize 50 million euro, probably in multiple phases, but partnering with uh, Africa HT, which is a, an important vehicle that has been set up uh, by the bank and uh, a fair number of African countries and based in uh, Morocco. So in partnership with Africa 50, we want to mobilize 50 million euro for project development uh, from climate uh, funds, but also partnering with a few selected project developers that we can uh, you, we can work with and finance this develop, early stage development of projects. Secondly, we believe blended finance will key and blended finance is using concessional resources, blended with commercial resources, in order either to make the tariff lower, so more attractive for countries, uh, which will encourage countries to be more open to private sector investment, or to de-risk the private sector investment, which will also um, encourage investors, project developers, to put more money in the region. Last but not least, public funding will still be important. So we have at, uh, at the African Development Bank some public funds for these countries to reinforce, for instance, their grid. But obviously, our own resources will never be uh, sufficient. So we are working closely with Agence France Development and our partners like the World Bank to mobilize more public funding. On the off-grid mini-grid part, we believe high level of concessionality is needed. So we are working also with our partners to mobilize these concessional resources. Public and private resources of the order of magnitude of 4 billion will be needed. Uh, part of it will, come, will be coming from the bank. But the innovation we want to bring here is through this pay-as-you-go system, we want to mobilize funding from the institutional investor. And the way we will do it is to use as a catalyst guarantees uh, to cover securitization schemes that will allow us to set up vehicles that can issue asset-backed securities that we can sell to these institutional investors. So this will be also our strategy for the off-grid and green mini grid part. Now, to just give you two examples before closing. Uh, one example that we, to show that we have already started actually, uh, desert to power. It's not only a concept, it's already a program that has been uh, operating. So for one year, we have been working in Burkina Faso uh, with Agence Française Development and the government to structure the Yellen solar program. So uh, it will include both an on-grid and an off-grid component. Uh, the, the aim is at first for first phase to mobilize 250 million euro and by November 2018 to have a financial close because this will be a public sector driven uh, project but at the same time these public sector resources will be used to mobilize for both uh, IPPs and uh, off-grid part mini-grids 
Uh, and the impact that we are seeking is uh, uh, as in a first stage to uh, provide power to 380,000 households, but ultimately to achieve universal access by 2025 in Burkina Faso. A second example is uh, in Mauritania. So uh, we had a team there uh, less than two weeks ago uh, after also a few um, interaction with the government. And the idea is to um, provide support to especially rural areas, for instance, uh, green mini grids, uh, because the Mauritania is a very wide country and we think that by providing support to the green mini grid program, we can, uh, we can respond to the needs. The approval here is, early, is, is in terms of timeline for early 2019, and the impact that we are looking for is in the short term, 150 megawatt, in the long term, universal. So what we would like for this webinar is first to inform you of what is going on and second to really um, invite you to be part of this movement and part of this program. The reason being we believe strongly in stakeholder engagement. Uh, we think that solutions should not come from financial institutions only. It should come from the ground and from the multiple with the synergy between uh, multiple actions. So private sector developers are important in order to identify the real needs, the bottlenecks and remove them, but also beneficiaries are uh, important and even I would say are the most important ones because they have to uh, explain uh, what their needs are, what also the constraints in the, at the country level are. So our objective today is to engage. Uh, so it's the first presentation on Desert to Power uh, so you will bear with us if uh, some of uh, the aspects need further elaboration. Uh, actually, we want you to be part of this elaboration. We will conduct with our uh, partner Solar Plaza, and I would like to thank them dearly for what they have been, uh, the support they have been bringing to the bank so far. Uh, we will be fielding business development missions uh, in uh, Niger, in Mali, and in Senegal in the coming uh, weeks. Uh, and uh, uh, the objective of these business development missions uh, is twofold. One is to identify immediate opportunities for investment, and second is to conduct a dialogue between government, uh, the local entrepreneur, and international players in order to find uh, the, the, the best structure of, of, for these programs. Secondly, we want also this to be an ongoing dialogue uh, not only for these roadshows, but also for social media. So our, coll our colleagues from, so from uh, Solar Plaza will set up also the systems to allow this growing interaction that will be key for this uh, program to, to work. So with this, I would like to thank you very much. And uh, once again, to ask you to really get involved. Uh, we are together on this and uh, the impact uh, will be tremendous in the region. And we feel that it's a transformation process that we are starting now. So we want you to be part of this transformation. Thank you very much. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Usainu Nakalima, for this great uh, presentation. And um, so we will now open the floor for our Q&A session while we change the slides. Yep. Um, so I would like to start off uh, with a few few questions uh, from the Solar Plaza side. Um, there have been already some great questions posted by um, participants of this webinar, so please continue to ask your questions on the right side of your screen uh, in the question box, and uh, we will make sure uh, to bring them up and discuss them. Uh, we have about 30 minutes maximum to go over the questions, so if you have any, please let us know. Um, the first question uh, I have is, how will the African Development Bank distribute the Desert to Power funding? And what are the project qualifiers that lead investor decisions? Thank you. Thank you, Lida, for, for this first question. I respond in two ways. One is that uh, there will be, first, a demand-driven approach for the distribution of funds. Uh, and that's why we are doing this roadshow and we are 
We went last year to Burkina about three, four times. We went uh, two weeks ago to Mauritania, and we are on, on our way to go to Niger, Mali, and Senegal. So it's, it should be first and foremost demand driven. Uh, and when I say demand driven, is taking into account not only the needs, but also, and more importantly, the constraints and the limitation. Uh, for instance, in Burkina, we just noted that uh, to go beyond 100 megawatts, we needed to reinforce the grid. So which means that uh, beyond uh, the private commercial investment that would uh, help put 100 megawatt, we had to mobilize some public sources to put some storage capacity, etc. So uh, that's why we are doing this. Audit. This is the first answer. The second answer is that uh, we want also uh, not only this to be demand driven, but we want uh, to have uh, a top down approach whereby we will work with private sector players, uh, partner with some of them based on a few criteria, have a kind of long term partnership whereby we can give them visibility on the resources in terms of especially blended finance resources that the bank with its partners could um, put at their disposal, provided they do the uh, groundwork, the development uh, work, as well as uh, agree on some of the uh, provisions uh, of, of the key documentation. So based on these conditions, we could um, give them visibility of the resources that will be available which can also lead them to uh, think about their plans in terms of uh, investment in these different countries. So this will have a direct effect on the future possible investment in this country. So these are the two ways we are thinking about allocation. Uh, but just to finish on that, the bank has resources, uh, both in terms of grants, but in a very limited way, but also in terms of um, uh, commercial uh, lending uh, capacity for, for these countries. The grants are allocated uh, by country every three years. So we are, in our dialogue with countries, uh, these countries may, may, may decide to allocate part of their uh, envelope to the program, as Burkina did actually already. Uh, so that could be also one, uh, one additional key for, for the distribution of, of, uh, of funding in, in the country. Okay, uh, thank you for your answer, uh, Usainu. Um, one of the participants in the webinar uh, is asking an additional question. Um, speaking about aligning the private and public interests um, and the mentioned joint investment as a tool, is there any tool the African Development Bank is thinking of at the moment for aligning the private and public interests? Yes, so one, uh, one scheme that we have already tested in Morocco is uh, the following one, is for us, the bank, to provide cheap concessional resources to the power utility or to a specialized agency for this public sector agency to run the uh, IPP procurement process. And the difference here would be that instead of this agency or this power utility to only to just sign a power purchase agreement with the private sector that will be selected. The idea is that they invest together in the power plant. So not to no longer have on one side of the table the power utility, on the other side of the table the uh, producer, but actually both of them to be co-owners uh, of the uh, special purpose vehicle that will produce the power, uh, that's one. And secondly, what we did in Morocco is for this power utility, which, is, which will be the off-taker, which will be the buyer of the power, to be the one actually providing part of the debt, just on lending the debt that the bank will have provided to them. So uh, the beauty of the scheme is that the, the buyer is the one also providing the debt, so it is then an incentive for the buyer to pay the bill, to, to pay the bills, you see, uh, and 
uh, this may help us get out of the issue of availability of guarantees, of sovereign guarantees, and further also conflicts between the buyer and the seller. So this is one example of alignment of interest, but we can think about alternative schemes uh, and we are very open, completely open to suggestions coming from actors uh, of the industry. Yeah, there is actually uh, one suggestion uh, of question mentioned towards in the, um, increasing the um, efficiency of the IPP development process uh, because uh, three uh, tools have been mentioned, uh, but they are also asking if there is any thought about uh, improving and increasing the transparency in the processes um, of IPP development. Uh, yeah, that's, a, that's an excellent uh, also point. Uh, you know, what we've noted in the past few years is that there is a tension between running a competitive bidding process, which sometimes can be a long process uh, and even sometimes an unfruitful process. I know a country where uh, they selected about uh, 20 uh, potential IPP, uh, 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 private sector developers, uh, and they promised to these 20 that they would negotiate a power purchase agreement. But, you know, four years later, uh, there's still, these private sector developers are still waiting for this power purchase agreement to be uh, vetted and approved and signed. Um, so the, the power the procurement processes are, in our experience, in the experience of countries, and in particular in the experience of developers, have been sometimes long and unsuccessful. On the other hand, uh, you have also uh, in some countries uh, what we call unsolicited bids, and uh, this, which sometimes lack of transparency and lack of uh, clear clarity in terms of how, whether these, whether the countries get uh, good value for money. So we need to to resolve uh, this tension. Uh, and the example I gave of the procurement process run uh, by Mazen in Morocco was uh, quite effective, quite good. Uh, so we, 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 we believe, yeah, we need to, to think about uh, more efficient processes. Uh, I'm not saying that we will not consider a project that comes out of an unsolicited bid, but this has to be uh, very well um, monitored and very well assessed in terms of uh, value, value for money. At the end of the day, I think the bottom line is that uh, it's important to be transparent. So uh, I think that's a uh, key. Information disclosure uh, will be one of the key principles uh, in whatever we are doing. So information disclosure, access information, this is one. Uh, secondly, uh, uh, as I said, alignment of interest is one way also to make sure that uh, everybody has um, in the, around the table has an incentive to close as soon as possible the, uh, the processes. Uh, so I, I, I believe uh, these two principles uh, may help uh, address the issue, but it's not a simple issue. I, I, I understand and our experience show that uh, it can be sometimes uh, quite, quite, quite daunting for for both public sector and private sector parties. Okay, thank you very much. Um, let's continue with the next question about the division uh, of budget directing towards the several um, countries in the Sahel region. Is there a minimum or maximum investment per country? Uh, the answer is no. There is no minimum nor maximum investment per country. Uh, what will be driving the numbers is a reality on the ground, you know. In a country where the grid in for the on-grid part cannot absorb uh, more than 100 megawatt, well, that's already a short term uh, a constraint. But at the same time, if you look at the off-grid part, uh, the I think the the uh, uh, the constraint there uh, will be uh, the ability to pay. Uh, the constraint uh, will be the sustainability of models. So I wouldn't put it in terms of minimum or maximum investment. I would put it more in terms of timeline and how fast we can deploy the resources and how fast 
the countries, the beneficiaries, the players can absorb uh, the deployment of resources. So this will be the key driving, the key driver. And I would say that uh, one of our key objectives in what we are doing today in, uh, in this dialogue, in uh, this outreach, is to see how we can accelerate the process. Because when you look at the past 15 years, well, the timeline for the deployment of these uh, generation capacities is not acceptable. It's uh, frustrating for all parties. It's uh, the cost of opportunity for the economy of these countries is just um, dramatic. So we need to fix that. We need to find new business models. We need to find new financing models in order to really change the paradigm in terms of deployment of these uh, generation capacities. So um, indeed, because um, there's a question coming in about uh, how you experience the level um, uh, the level of interest uh, in solar in the several uh, African Sahel countries uh, because they might uh, vary a bit um, and that question is linked of course also to um, the budget intended to invest in the countries on uh, solar energy uh, because people are wondering uh, how you work with governments who are not that much uh, stimulating solar power. Um, are you also active in these countries? countries to promote the industry well, and how? Well, you know, Lija, it's amazing the level of interest that is being expressed now by governments and by private sector players. It's just amazing. Uh, you know, to, I remember only three years ago, I was talking to one head of state, no more than three years ago. And this head of state was telling me that, well, Solar power is nice, but you know, guys, I need my country to industrialize. So I would uh, prioritize, I'm sorry, I, I, I like the climate, uh, but I would prioritize putting a, a coal power plant of 200 megawatts that can uh, uh, help my industry get off the ground. Well, actually, two years later, I heard the same head of state uh, saying forcefully that, look, I've tested in my country solar power plants. And actually, while I was trying to deploy a 200 megawatt coal power plant for the past five years, well, these solar power plants have been deployed in less than 12 months. And so I, I want to mobilize whatever I can in terms of my own people, in terms of my partners to scale up these type of investments. So this is just one example. But if you go to this country that I mentioned, they see solar as a fast way to provide power people, even uh, people who are far from the grid, and in particular, people who are far from the grid. Secondly, it's a way that is cheaper and cheaper. If you look at the numbers, you know, solar, the cost of solar panels have been divided by 10 in the past 10 years. So it speaks by itself. So there is a strong political will. And you have to combine this by, at the international level, uh, mobilization around the issue of climate. So there should be concessional resources available to make the tariff, these sources, even more competitive than the others. So if you combine these two factors, actually, the window of opportunity has never been as big as today for, for this industry to take off. And last but not least, uh, it's a tremendous opportunity to create jobs. And you know, you know in, the, in countries of this region, jobs are the issue and, and the, the political implication of unemployment is just uh, uh, daunting for, for the governments. Uh, many people are saying, that one of the reasons of the Arab Spring is actually unemployment. So solar power, solar generation is also one way to really accelerate the creation of jobs, uh, both for the maintenance of these plants, but also uh, for the conception and the construction. Uh, so yeah, I think that's a unique opportunity uh, for, for the continent that we should not miss. 
Okay, um, thank you. Um, there are some people um, writing questions about ways to get involved in the Desert Power program. Um, so maybe uh, you can update us a little bit on how people from the private sector, DFIs and institutions can partner or get involved when they want to uh, be part of this uh, great um, investment program. Um, and then we go to more concrete questions about what that would practically look like. Okay, very good. So I think uh, there are many ways to get involved. Uh, for uh, investors, for uh, suppliers, you know, what we are doing now is to, we are designing uh, for each country a program that will include um, both an on-grid part and an off-grid part. And so, for instance, in Burkina, I mentioned the 250 million euro program that we are designing. And part of this program will be aimed at um, mobilizing private sector players. For instance, on the mini grid part, uh, we are already we have already uh, informed some of our uh, clients that there will be opportunities for them to invest in mini grids in Burkina Faso. So I would invite um, whoever is active in this field to uh, get ready to uh, participate to, and, and, and seize the opportunities that uh, this program will open. So, so first way to get involved is actually to be ready to invest uh, uh, as soon as the uh, environment is, is ready and the program is, is launched. Uh, but most importantly, what we, what we need is for people to get uh, engaged and to tell us uh, what are the constraints and how we should design this program. To give you one example, uh, about uh, two months ago, I was talking to a project developer, uh, Focus on Power, and who is based in Dubai. Uh, and we had a very interesting and insightful discussion around his own experience in the region. And he was telling me in a nutshell, look, Husseino, in some of these countries, you can pour billion and billion of dollars. Well, things will not fly because one, uh, the public sector, count, our public sector counterpart lacks of uh, transaction advisory. So if you don't provide them transaction advisory, and, and given that there's no standard uh, documents approved, uh, this will take ages. So you need to provide them with uh, transaction advice. Secondly, he said the grid is saturated in the country. So if you don't design a public sector component, then it will not fly. So this is an example of dialogue that can help us structure the program properly. And last but not least, another way to get the, uh, involved is actually uh, to, 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 at country level, uh, to help us um, uh, foster the emergence of local entrepreneurs, of local uh, industry. Why? Because an international player setting up a power plant in uh, Niger will most likely need people at the local level, at the, at the country level, uh, to, with, with proper skills to do the maintenance, etc. So uh, one thing that we're trying to do, for instance, in the context of program, is to set, up, to set up a school, a vocational school, that can help train technicians uh, for, for the solar industry, and that can be uh, available for, for the different uh, players. So these are, the, in a nutshell, uh, what we, the, the type of uh, involved uh, actions we, we expect from our counterparts. And obviously, we are in contact with our institutional partners, like uh, multilateral institutions, the bilateral institutions, uh, and uh, the needs are such that the resources from the bank will be very tiny, but we, we want to, uh, to open the door, you know, by using our own resources to, as we say, we, we want to walk the talk by deploying our own resources, but this will not be sufficient. So I would also invite uh, my colleagues from all other institutions to consider uh, solar projects in these countries as a priority and to see how we can mutualize our forces and, and, and synchronize 
synchronize our actions uh, because uh, at country level sometimes actions are very fragmented and not uh, synchronized enough so that's also another way to to help uh, move this forward so uh, thank you Seno. i see uh, that there is a lot a lot of interest from people and uh, a lot of questions still coming in uh, so so what I would like to do is try to go over as much of them as possible um, to at least uh, provide ev everyone, maybe not everyone, but as much as possible with an answer. <laughs> um, so let's try to keep the, from now on questions and uh, answers quite brief. So um, everyone has still an opportunity to, to ask a question. Um, so there is someone from the private sector who would like to get started today and uh, he is asking um, if private sector players can directly access funds or would it be uh, through the public sector? Okay, so the, the short answer uh, is, and I, I'll try to keep it short, uh, given that there are many, many questions, uh, two ways, <clears throat> depending on the size of the project. For projects that are the, uh, above, uh, 30 megawatt. So these are quite large projects. Uh, the the private sector player can access the bank directly by just uh, uh, submitting a request for for funding for financing. For projects that are smaller, under 30 megawatt, uh, you know the bank. You have to consider the bank as a kind of wholesaler. So for smaller projects, we need intermediaries. And one important point I didn't mention in the presentation is that. The bank is setting up uh, a vehicle for small projects, uh, for small renewable energy projects. Uh, so uh, this vehicle is called the facility for energy inclusion. Uh, and the objective is to set up $500 million. The bank has already committed $100 million to this vehicle. And a few of our partners did, this, did the same, committed some, some resources like the Nordic Development Fund. So we, um, the objective is to reach financial close by end of June. And this, uh, this facility will be managed outside of the bank by a dedicated fund manager, which has already been selected actually, and which is also helping to uh, finalize the mobilization of, of resources. And this will be our window for small projects. So the private sector player will be able to address the request directly to to that uh, to that fund. Okay, and um, is it possible to already give more clarity on the nature of the funding? Um, uh, are there grants, repayable grants, debts, etc.? Uh, and what in what percentages are they available? Okay, so we have the traditional instruments of the bank, uh, mostly loans uh, and for port finance structures. So this is something that is that will still be here. So any IPP can approach the bank for financing. We can finance up to one third of the project cost and uh, the uh, pricing will depend on the, the risk and the, the experience of the sponsor. But I think the, the main benefit made advantage of uh, our funding is uh, that it is long term. Uh, it's, uh, the maturity can go up to 18 years, um, which you cannot find in, unfortunately, in commercial banks. Uh, so that's our main product. But besides, uh, we can also provide other instruments like uh, guarantees. And that's, that's something we are trying to, um, to do more and more, especially to crowd in uh, local commercial banks. We want local commercial banks to be part of the financing of this project. So in some cases, we can provide them uh, guarantees to extend the majority of their loans. Uh, so that's something also we can do. Uh, this is one. Secondly, uh, we can provide project preparation funding. I mentioned uh, project development uh, vehicle that we want to set up, the 50 million euro project development vehicle that we be working on to provide either reimbursable grants or uh, funding that can uh, uh, support the early stage uh, development and that can then be translated into equity. Uh, so that's also another vehicle. And last but not least, the bank has been for the past six years 
providing grants to project developers, uh, small grants, uh, around $1 million, for a vehicle that we call the Sustainable Energy Fund for Africa. But we are getting very close to the end of the deployment of the resources of this uh, fund. So we are getting into um, a new mobilization of funding for the second round. And uh, these, uh, in the second stage of this fund, we may provide what we call reimbursable grants. So instead of just putting outright grants, we can, we will try to provide grants that are linked to the type of outcome of the project. And uh, speaking about uh, local banking, um, will the program also consider undertaking capacity building for local banks in order to attract more local financing? Yeah, I think that's a great uh, suggestion. You know, the bank has a lot of experience working and providing, uh, working with and providing lines of credit to commercial banks in Africa. Uh, but we want to do something that goes just beyond supporting the balance sheet of, of these banks. Uh, what we would like to do is to design a um, financial instrument for these financial intermediaries, but that, that are targeted to a sector. And in uh, our case, that will be targeted to renewable energy, in particular solar projects. So one way for us to do it would be to uh, provide both these kind of guarantees that I mentioned, and as you rightly said, leader, technical assistance in order to help them uh, get a little bit more experience in uh, undertaking the due diligence on these projects uh, and do also even the origination. So that's something we're doing today in uh, in Zambia. You know, we, we are partnering with the, the Green Climate Fund to uh, provide, so Zambia is outside of the Sahel region, obviously, but uh, this is something we're doing there in partnership with the GCF, the Green Climate Fund. So we're providing resources to a uh, small scale uh, solar IPP, IPP projects that uh, will be selected for the feed-in tariff uh, procurement uh, test. So we, we are also working with the KFW and the idea is to provide them resources, but uh, partnering with local banks. So co-financing these with local banks and these local banks benefit from uh, this instrument that I mentioned, which is the extension of maturity. At the same time, we are providing technical assistance to help these banks uh, uh, we have, have the capacity to process these kind of transactions. So, and then uh, we have a great participation from Nigeria today. Um, and someone from Nigeria is asking um, someone with an interest in off-grid and uh, mini-grids, um, is Nigeria part of this plan uh, on the off-grid and mini-grids? And yes, do we have a timeline in place? Yes, can you repeat please, Lydia? The line was not good. So the question is, uh, we have um, great participation today from Nigeria. Uh, and someone from Nigeria uh, with an interest in off-grid and mini-grids is wondering whether Nigeria is part of this plan. And uh, if yes, uh, is there a timeline in place? Yes, definitely. Nigeria is, is really is an important part of, the, of this plan. It's among the 11 countries. And we have already started actually uh, working uh, with Nigeria, both on the on grid part and the off grid medical part. On the on grid part, we are part uh, of the pool of uh, financial institutions that are, that are trying to support the IPPs, the independent power producer that were selected under the, uh, the, the current process. And on the other hand, on the off grid and medical part, we have been uh, discussing and we have, we, are, we have engaged with the rural electrification agency to set up to set up a, a local fund, uh, we are also uh, in this this uh, project partnering with the, the foundation, uh, the All Own Foundation, to set up a fund that will provide equity to off-grid and mini-grid players. So timeline for this fund uh, is actually uh, this year, 2018. Our objective uh, is to submit a request of uh, uh, 
uh, funding to the climate fund by end of June and to have our board consider by the end of the year an investment uh, in this in this fund that will uh, address uh, the needs of uh, of Kira and Minicate players in Nigeria. So um, we are already passing the one hour time slot for this webinar. So uh, I will would like I hope to this take answers the question. Yeah, I would like to take uh, two or three more questions, and uh, then unfortunately we have to wrap it up. Um, there's Hello, someone... Lydia. I can't hear you. So you can you hear me now, Usenu? Yes. Hello. Can you hear hear me? We would like to go over two or three more questions before Hello, we wrap Lydia. up the webinar. If Usenu can still hear me, of course. Uh, unfortunately, we have a connection issue. Um, I hope that will be solved in a few minutes. Hello. Hello, Senu. Are you still in? Yes, we I can, can hear, hear you now. Ah, that's I great. No, no problem. So uh, we will just continue the webinar. We already passed the one hour deadline of this webinar, but I would like to ask you two or three more questions if the connection allows us uh, and then wrap it up, unfortunately, because we are out of time. Um, but there's someone who would like to know whether the 5 million fund is limited to the Sahel region or can also include other countries, especially in West Africa. Yes. So. Uh, the program that I mentioned, the Desert to Power program, is focusing on the Sahel region. And the, being, the, the reason being that uh, we found that this was kind of both from the climate point of view, the development, uh, the energy for development perspective, the kind of mother of all battles. But that doesn't mean that the bank will not work uh, in the solar industry, in the solar sector, in the other countries. All the opposite. We are working for all African countries, so which means that even though the instruments that I mentioned here will be dedicated to that region, uh, the traditional instruments of the bank will still be available for the rest. So the 3 million euro project development fund I mentioned is for the Sahel region, uh, but Africa 50, which is a, a close partner, I would say even a sister of the bank, is already providing project development funding uh, in all country, in all their member countries, and I mentioned the facility for energy inclusion, which covers up the, the whole continent, the whole sub-Saharan Africa. So that also uh, will still be available. And last but not least, I mentioned the Sustainable Energy Fund for Africa, which is this facility that has been operating for the past uh, six years. So we are going into replenishment, and once we've uh, achieve this replenishment, it will be also used and available for all sub-Saharan Arab countries. Okay, and then we take our final question of today. Um, how do international players who have adapted mini-grid or on-grid solutions for Africa pose their interest to execute projects? Yeah, so the question is how we can express the interest, right? to exactly. execute the project. Yes. OK, very good. Uh, I think the best way is just to contact us. I think this webinar was a way to uh, have a first interaction and a first outreach to you. But uh, uh, one of the reasons why we are partnering with Solar Plaza is that Solar Plaza has a lot of experience in uh, mobilizing and engaging with industry. So together, what we want is to have an efficient and uh, to be very accessible. Um, so please don't hesitate to contact us and we will be very keen to explore with you how we can use all the instruments that I mentioned to uh, support your agenda in solar in this region. So our objective is for both countries, our client countries and our client clients from this from the industry to benefit from, from this uh, effort uh, just for your for, for, for one example is that two weeks ago uh, i was in a panel with two important players 
international players of the uh, mini grid uh, off grid space of the energy space but most particularly in the mini grid space and one idea that we talked about was since mini grids are small 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 investment scattered around uh, many countries many regions so one idea that we wanted to explore is to uh, set a special purpose vehicle that will not only de develop one mini grid but a portfolio of mini grid and then depending on the commitment of this international player the bank can consider supporting uh, the, this at the portfolio level and not at the single uh, single uh, project level so in a nutshell the conclusion for me for this question is that we are in a sector that is evolving fast and that needs that is desperate for innovation and we the bank we are here to support uh, players at the country level at the international level actually drive innovation So thank you very much, Husseinu, for providing a uh, first insight into the Desert2 Power program uh, today. Thank you for your presentation and uh, taking the time to answer so many questions. And I would also like to thank the participants in the audience uh, who have been very actively with the uh, Q&A session. Um, there were some great questions and uh, unfortunately we couldn't answer all of them, but uh, we've managed to do quite a, quite a few. Um, I would like to wrap up this webinar um, by announcing some upcoming events that we have. Uh, we will focus on uh, unlock unlocking solar capital uh, in Latin America, the 28th and the 29th of June 2018. Uh, of course, we host this webinar because the 15th and 16th of May, uh, uh, we will be present in Abuja, Nigeria, to take a closer look at the Nigerian solar market. Uh, and by the end of this year, we will return to Africa with our Pan-Africa uh, Unlocking Solar Capital event uh, that will take place in Kigali, Rwanda this year. It is the same conference that uh, we uh, were hosting in Abidjan um, last October. Uh, so, Usainu Nakulima, thank you very much. And uh, thank you thank you for attending this webinar. Have a great day and uh, hopefully till next time. Bye-bye.